This episode of Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point is sponsored by Blue Bridge Games. For the games and gifts you won't find anywhere else, head to Grand Rapids, Michigan's friendliest local game store, Blue Bridge Games. Blue Bridge Games carries an extensive line of board games, card games, role-playing tabletop games, Magic the Gathering, and more. Stop into their storefront on East Fulton or shop with them online at bluebridgegames.com. You say you want to watch a drama. You say you want to watch a comedy. Well, you can watch it with your mama. Or you can watch it with your daddy. You'll even sit and watch it with your middle schooler. So you can come and talk around our water cooler. We're watching all day and all night. Couch Potatoes Unite. Whoa, whoa. Couch Potatoes Unite. Whoa. Welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog of the same name because how urbane Also, we're doing the same thing we do every night, Pinky, trying to take over the world. My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like for at Couch Potatoes Unite. We're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panelists and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the website or podcast via iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Digital Radio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, Amazon Music, basically wherever you get your podcasts to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including, but not limited to, Stranger Things, iZombie, The Good Place, Game of Thrones, Grace and Frankie, Mr. Robot, Altered Carbon, The Orville, Outlander, Westworld, Fuller House, Schitt's Creek, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Crown, Big Little Lies, The Good Doctor, Doctor Who, and Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for The Hundred, the American Horror Story franchise series panel. New name will talk about Season 1 of American Horror Stories. The DCTU series panel will reflect upon Season 4 of Black Lightning, and the Star Trek 50 Plus series will discuss Season 1 of Deep Space Nine. We'll be launching new panels covering Killing Eve, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, American Gods, Grey's Anatomy, Cobra Kai, Peaky Blinders, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, A Discovery of Witches, The Hauntings of Hill House and Bly Manor, Titans, and Umbrella Academy. And because we look back at shows now past, we'll travel through time and experience all sorts of identities with Quantum Leap, we'll cry bazinga for Big Bang Theory, we'll navigate the witty political satire of Parks and Recreation, we'll become psychos for Psych, we'll go where everybody knows your name with cheers, we hope you'll be listening when we talk about Frasier, We'll know that's what she said when we talk about The Office from the UK and the USA. We'll show off our kung fu for Chuck, and we'll debate whether saving the cheerleader actually saved the world by looking at all iterations of heroes. By the way, did you know that CPU also from time to time goes live? You've been live from bunkers, comedy shows, comic cons, and game stores. Plus, we're planning more live appearances and other cool stuff. It's really true, including in whatever we're calling these times. So make sure you like or follow us at our Facebook page, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or subscribe to our website, YouTube channel, Apple iTunes channel, Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Castbox, iHeartRadio, and Amazon Music. In the meantime, if you don't hear a show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews, and we always seek new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of the outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback, and if we were better people, we'd ignore you and go on with our lives. But we're not. In other words, if you're not nice, we'll give you the mallet with our best slappy squirrel impression in tow. Today's panel and I are continuing a new Looking Back to Look Forward series as requested by several of our resident couch potatoes and couch potatoes adjacent. If you aren't already aware, from time to time, CPU chooses shows of all types, but usually of some fame or notoriety to reminisce about, and to consider whether or not they age gracefully like Slappy Squirrel, now that's comedy, or don't hold up as well like most of the brain's plans to take over the world. As such, this is another Another chapter of our Looking Back podcast episodes where we review a show that has been gone either via natural end or cancellation for some time. And this is but one chapter in a multi-part series in which we will explore the original and rebooted versions of the most zany to the max cartoon in Warner Brothers history, the much-beloved 
Animaniacs. In fact, today, in our second discussion, we're looking back at the last three seasons of the original run, otherwise known as the WB seasons, of this baloney in your slacks kind of animated delight. Each new episode in this new CPU series will progress through subsequent seasons of Animaniacs, moving to the rebooted seasons that began streaming on Hulu in fall 2020 in our next episode. To that end, season three of the original run aired from September 9, 1995 to February 24, 1996, with a total of 13 episodes. Season four aired from September 7, 1996 to November 16, 1996, and contained eight episodes. And season five aired from September 8, 1997 to November 14, 1998 with a total of nine episodes. These episodes all aired in the Kids WB lineup, though as on Fox, it managed to draw in more adult viewers than child viewers, causing consternation for advertisers and the eventual end of the original series as a result. We can't get started without a tiny reminder of context and praise, though, so let's, without further ado... Animaniacs is an American animated comedy musical television series created by Tom Ruger for Fox Broadcasting Company's Fox Kids Black before moving to the WB in 1995 as part of its Kids WB afternoon programming block until the series ended in 1998. It is the second animated series produced by Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment in association with Warner Brothers Animation after Tiny Toon Adventures. It initially ran a total of 99 episodes along with a feature-length film, Wacko's Wish. Animaniacs is a variety show with short skits featuring a large cast of characters. While the show has no set format, the majority of episodes are composed of three short mini-episodes, each starring a different set of characters and bridging segments. Hallmarks of the series include its music, satirical social commentary, pop culture references, character catchphrases, and innuendo directed at an adult audience. The main characters, the Warner siblings, Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, live in the water tower on the Warner Brothers studio lot in Burbank. California. However, characters from the series have episodes in various places and periods of time. The Animaniacs characters interact with famous people and creators of the past and present, as well as mythological characters and characters from contemporary pop culture and television. Today, in part two of our multi-part Animaniacs, the past and future show's namey series, our crew of Zany to the Max Animaniac fans, Nick, Michael, Christian, and Ryan, as well as your very involved moderator, will talk about the finer and less fine points of the WB seasons, that is, seasons three through five of the original version of this beloved cartoon. It should be noted that all of our panelists have viewed much of the OG Animaniac series and may discuss sensitive plot points, jokes, sight gags, and other comedic elements best appreciated on a first watch. So for those of you who have not watched any Animaniacs of any type and plan to do so, listen at your own risk as there may be major spoilers. Welcome back, panel. How are you? Great. Ooh. Are you excited? <laughs> What? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> I said fabu. Oh, fabu. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, panel, are you ready to talk about the WB seasons of the Animaniacs? Yeah. Absolutely. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Well, great. So what I'm going to do is take your temperature along the standard CPU character question, which changes with each show we do, because the WB seasons of the show kind of altered the show a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. So to that end, I've altered our character question a little bit, and what I'd like you to do is answer the character question with your eye toward these three seasons, as opposed to the first two much heralded and lauded seasons that we discussed in our last episode. Sound good? Sounds perfect. Great. Remember, if you're nodding, this is a podcast. Vocal yeses are encouraged. Okay, so how would you say you feel about the WB seasons of Animaniacs along this slightly altered character question? Oh, and by the way, P.S., if you forgot from listening to our last episode or from being a general listener of Couch Potatoes Unite, when it's a comedy, I do really bad impressions. I'm self-aware but I'm still going to do them. Okay, here we go. The Animaniacs are good dogs. They're definitely good dogs, like Runt. The little donut went to markets. This little donut had a date. This little donut had roast beef. And this little donut got eight. Yums, like Ralph the Guard. He's the hardest. I'm sorry. It's both delicious and fabu, like Wacko Warner. 
It's fine if you can stand all the unwanted attention. Hello, nurse. Like, hello, nurse. Boys, go fig. Anyway, like you, the Animaniacs, as in the show, is cute. But you're cuter, and you can't help it, like Dot Warner. As far back as you can remember, you always wanted to be a member of the Animaniacs fan club. It's like being one of the Three Musketeers. Or the Good Feathers, like Squid. Are you saying I'm a musketeer? Are you saying that I am a net funicello here to wear mouse ears for you? That I am some kind of hey there, hi there, ho there, come and join the jamboree punk on a kid's TV show? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> like pesto. Bada bing, bada boom. Like Bobby. Stop playing with my bust. Like Dr. Scratch and Sniff. Good night, everybody. Like Yakko Warner. Okay, I love you. Bye bye. Like Mindy. A roo, droopy head. Like Buttons. Spew! Like Skippy Squirrel. Don't tell them. They might crack. Like Slappy Squirrel. Or Don. There goes my trip to Aruba. Like Rita. Who would like to start? We're just like a quick start by applauding the like narrative you have in the the scale this time. That's impressive. <laughs> the whole middle section is like there was a progresses flow, right? very well. Yeah, thanks. And now because you spoke, you get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fooey. <laughs> I don't know. Well, okay, so the scale also used to be a couple other times I've I've done these. It was like What you is know, your good name? To bad. Now it's just kind of like What is your name? Oh. <laughs> that's Christian. Is Hi my name. Christian is your name. Hi. Hi. People. <laughs> and so anyway, you were saying I, about the up. awesome. I like it, but where is that on the scale anymore? <laughs> it's in the top third. <laughs> okay. It's both delicious and fabu, I guess, because that's the shortest one that I just saw with my eyes. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Welcome back, Christian. Thanks. <laughs> so I don't remember who I was earlier last time, so I can't tell if I've changed or not. But what is your I name? <laughs> Have you all forgotten Hi, how to do this? <laughs> <laughs> I was getting there. I was oh, getting there. okay. <laughs> yes, I'm Michael. Hi, Michael. <laughs> and I don't remember any of these episodes when they first aired because apparently I'd never, which is so crazy because I was still young enough to watch them. But I'm thinking what happened is that we just didn't get them when the show switched to the WB. I don't think the Grand Rapids had a WB station or at least on a kid's WB, like Saturday morning thing. So I don't think I ever watched these when they first aired because I didn't remember any of them. And then, but they're great. But I just think because I don't remember the bits on repeat viewings, it's still like, they're not like super like memorable in my mind right now. And that's only because I've only watched them once. So, but they're still good. So I think I'm definitely a runt. You think they're good Can we good just dogs? put what he just said in the scale so I can say what he said? You instead could, of... Well, he picked runt, and you could have done oh, that. Oh, <laughs> no, I mean what he said before that. Oh. Yeah, I hadn't seen any of these. I don't think. I was trying uh, to got go... whatever channel. <laughs> eh? I was trying to go for some brevity, Christian, and Michael had a little bit of an explanation there. <laughs> Well, I liked his explanation, and I'm echoing it. Fair enough. So, upvotes on Michael's explanation, and welcome back, Michael, the resident runt so far. I'm Nick. Hi, I'll Nick. say that first. I'll oh, say that job. first. So he's a very good dog. <laughs> he is a very good dog. <laughs> and that's what I was going to say. It was the Animaniacs are good dogs. Definitely good dogs. So, runt. So, you would still enjoy the WB seasons? I... Definitely watched Kids WB and all the shows on that and didn't really know until we started talking about doing this podcast that there was a difference between the first. So my kid memories still just, it's it's all the Animaniacs and I don't really notice. I knew that Pinky and the Brain split off because I was watching Kids WB and I watched the Pinky and the Brain show and it, that was spun off. Welcome back, Nick. Thanks. So I guess that leaves me. I'm Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Thinking about this as far as how I would rate it, I guess as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a part of the Animaniacs fan club. It's like being one of the Three Musketeers or the Good Feathers. So I, 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 I enjoyed it very much. The, the bits and pieces that I did get to see, same, same thing has been echoed with a lot of different folks. I'm not sure if Basic Cable, where I grew up in northern Michigan, carried the WB. I do remember seeing parts of those shows, but I don't know if I got to see it all in its original run. But I absolutely wanted to be a part of the Animaniacs fan club. 
I love that show. Which makes you squit. <laughs> Welcome back, Ryan. <laughs> and of course, my name is Kylie. I both moderate and participate on this panel, as is often the case. I don't remember what I was last time either. I probably would have picked Runt and certainly Wacko. Wacko is my favorite. And I'm going to stick with Wacko this time. I still liked these three seasons a lot. I echo Michael's sentiments. I don't think we had a WB in Grand Rapids for a while. And if we did, I don't think I realized that the Animaniacs moved over. I did know that Pinky and the Brain had their own show because I watched that one. But I did not remember any of the episodes that I watched in this chunk from the Animaniacs or any of the individual segments. And I have a pretty good memory for these things, especially because this is my favorite cartoon of all time. I think I said that last time. And so it was like watching a whole new aspect of the show in some respects. But I, I also just love Wacko for all the reasons I said before. He's, you know, I mean, he's not like ladylike or anything, but <laughs> he's got the voice. He's got Jess Harnell's voice and doing the sort of Ringo thing. So that's where I think I'll be. It's delicious and fabu. So welcome back, panelists. We are here now in our last episode. We kind of talked about the core of the Animaniacs, the heart and soul of it, but we're not going to break it down because this three seasons was a little bit more different, a little bit tweaked because Pinky and the Brain got spun off than the first two seasons, especially that first season, which has the bulk of the episodes. So really wanted to get you kind of thinking about comparing the two segments what you liked, what you didn't like in this segment compared to the last two seasons, and so forth. Who would like to start talking about the general oeuvre of the WB seasons? One of the things that I really enjoyed about seasons three through five is, like most TV shows, it felt like by about the third season, it really found its comedic footing. There, there's a lot of great jokes in the first couple of seasons, for sure, absolutely. But by season three... They kind of zeroed in on this is the kind of humor that we really want to try and, and hit. A lot of the parodies of pop culture, a lot of the, the, the songwriting really got very good in seasons three through five. It seemed a little bit more, at least season three and season four and a chunk of season five was going really smoothly. By the time we get to the end of season five, it felt like things were, at least to me, unraveling a little bit, like they knew that the end was coming, but weren't quite sure how to fully wrap it up. And there were other bits and pieces that hopefully I'll get to talk about a little bit later. Some of the, the hints that they were dropping. But overall, I, I think that it's just as good, maybe even a little bit better as an overall show. Hmm. Interesting. I'm not sure I would call it. I mean, I think the quality of the animation the character design of the actual Warner Brothers, for me, is like the best character design. Because in the first few episodes of the first chunk, you can kind of see they're going back and forth between certain more... Some episodes they have the classic like 1930s look of black and white cartoons, but then sometimes they have more of a rounded, rubbery look to them. And then... This In this chunk, I feel like they settled on an in-between where they have kind of the look of the old 1930s characters, but, they have, but they're still keeping that sort of rounded look, and, but they're not as rubbery as some of those early episodes. And so I feel like, to me, this is the best characters of design for the Warners in particular. And it just seems like the, the look of their faces and their facial expressions and the way they are able to convey all of those gags through them. It, to me, this is the best when they settle on that look. I, that's the best look for the three of them. Actually reminded me of one of my favorite episodes, which I think was I just kind of took notes episode by episode. I was much more thorough this time than last time, which wasn't hard to do. But I think it was episode 11 where they're just jumping back and forth between satires of different eras of cartoons and different specific cartoons and stuff. I think that was that one. Where they, there's like a Betty Boop knockoff and anyone? Yes, yeah, no, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Good save. <laughs> we remember what you're talking about. I was like, yes, I don't know if that's that episode happened. 11. But <laughs> <laughs> and like I said in the intro, I didn't notice a big difference as a kid. I mean, I definitely watched 
the show when it was on Fox and I watched those shows and I really when it I, I probably didn't even notice it moved over when I was channel surfing the five channels that I had back then. But I do looking at a list of shows that were on Kids WB, I remember just watching them all at this point. And Animani I loved Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain and Freakazoid and the Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries and the Superman animated series. Like this was all part of that block and it I was definitely watching this instead of what they were competing with and what they were created to compete with and what Animaniacs was already on was the Fox Kids block. Do you remember what time? Because I, now that you say this, now this is going to, I'm just going to reveal again that I am the oldest person on this panel. <laughs> and so I would have been in college, I think, for at least part of this, this part of the run or maybe entering college. And I remember watching... Batman the animated series and Superman the animated series and and Freakazoid. I did not I watch Freakazoid. Freakazoid when it was on. I didn't watch Freakazoid. But I also well, remember I, watching Pinky and the Brain, so maybe well, I wasn't in well, class. <laughs> you have to remember Cartoon Network might have thrown these things out there in syndication. syndication. Oh. And their Cartoon that? Cartoon Fridays. I have the dates here if you want me to tell you. <laughs> because this Kids WB went all the way into the 2000s. Mm -hmm. And they had the the Superman series, the new Batman Adventures, and then they had the new Batman Superman Adventures. So that, like, those shows went way beyond. And Batman Beyond was, I remember watching that a lot too. But I love that show. And that was 99 through 2001. But, like, Pinky and the Brain was airing into 2001. When? When were you in college? Before that. <laughs> oh, okay. Pull up, Nick. Pull up. <laughs> yeah, Nick. <laughs> Don't ask a lady her age. <laughs> but so I, anyway, yeah. I think this was. I think this was. Must have just been on cable, like because the WB stuff that I saw growing up was like that weird, like Pax channel. Again, yeah. maybe this is only like a central northern Michigan movie where I can speak to this, but like, because I watched like Charmed and Roswell and stuff a little bit, but I never saw any of this. So, so I, guess back I was going to gonna ask, movie. I'm from Chicago, so I have a different TV experience than what it sounds like most of you. But, but it wasn't cable, thought, you don't think? <laughs> we we didn't have cable. Chicago when I was would have been a major yeah, outlet. That was my only WB. theory. Yeah. No, that but makes sense. Had, did you have UPN? Not till later. Mm. There, it, I it feel came like that's what this was on. And then I did, then PAX. I do remember PAX coming on because Supermarket Sweep. Come on. I generally <laughs> remember that I, and now that Christian mentions PAX, I think the channel, and I was, I mean, I went to school in the Southeast Michigan area, so there would have been more of this. Ann Arbor, for those who aren't keeping track. But I do remember that the channel that had these shows was part-time PAX and part-time WB stuff. And I just don't remember, like, I honestly don't remember how I would have caught some, and I didn't watch all of the iterations of Batman and Superman. I just specifically remember the Batman-Superman combination one. And then I remember Batman the Animated Series, but I don't think that was on the WB. That first one, no, was Fox. Yeah, the original wasn't. But then WB did a different one. Yeah. And you could, the animation is like similar, but not. Yeah. Right. So I just, in terms of when the channel would have switched on to the WB <laughs> and shown the Animaniacs, I'm not yeah. entirely sure that anywhere in Michigan, outside of Detroit, certainly, and I'm not even sure about Detroit, got the full WB experience until the latest of the 90s, early 2000s. Because I do remember UPN launching when I was in college, but this was, I don't think this was on it. I Nick, maybe it was just that yeah. one hour time difference. Well, there are Chicago's also the third largest city, so it probably had real TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which though is weird because in in the back of my brain, for some reason, I was thinking that in the northern lower peninsula of Michigan where I grew up, for some reason, the WB and WGN were they, they're both sticking together. It might have been one of those things where WGN as a super station which is different than the WGN9 that came out of Chicago, the over-the-air stuff. The the Superstation WGN might have had some of that WB programming, especially 
during their kids' block to try and boost viewership in between showing you know, Bulls games and Cubs games and, and all of that stuff. So maybe that's where I ended up getting it. But again, it's been a couple of weeks since the 90s, so I'm not sure I remember <laughs> totally clearly. A couple of weeks. <laughs> Time is irrelevant. Yes. So to that end, I don't know if I would say that, because Ryan, you started by saying that these were in some ways an improvement over the first two seasons. I don't know if I completely agree with that sentiment. I think anything involving the Warner Brothers and sister definitely got streamlined and was tighter and that kind of stuff. But because Pinky and even though there were some Pinky and the Brain segments occasionally, because Pinky and the Brain got their own show and they were like the second most important <laughs> set of characters to me anyway, I think I liked these seasons a little bit less. There was far more Slappy Squirrel. There was relatively more Good Feathers. There wasn't a lot of Rita and Runt, which was weird. I don't think he had access to Bernadette Peters, so that's part of the problem. Yeah. I suspect yeah, that. Yeah. I think Bernadette got busy on Broadway and whatnot, so... Yeah, and so then they relied more on the little shorts, like... Randy Beeman's friend and Katie Kaboom and good idea, bad idea and all that stuff, which is fun. I just think that the balance was a little bit different. I still liked it and enjoyed it. And I think there are a lot of really good, the parody episodes specifically in these three seasons are probably my favorites of everything. But I just felt like it was a lot easier to not totally pay attention to them. And I agree with Michael that I don't, there's not a lot of super memorable stuff from these three seasons, at least through a first watch, which apparently this was for me. <laughs> so <laughs> Most of us, yeah. And see, I can I can totally understand where you're coming from, especially if Pinky and the Brain was such a big thing. My favorite part was always watching the Warner Brothers. And because they I they got a little bit more focused in these episodes, that might have contributed to the fact that I like these a little bit more. There's not quite as much other stuff in there you get more of the warners overall i think i can kind of agree with both of you because overall my i was thinking maybe around season four or something i just kind of caught myself like is this childhood sacrilege do i like these newer ones better that i didn't watch in my childhood like that was kind of my overall impression but then as i'm looking at the aforementioned notes i thought i was so thorough with i don't have anything until like season three episode six so I think I'm actually remembering too because like I my first attempt at a binge did not go well. So it could just be that the very first few episodes of season three just aren't as strong as the rest, and, and maybe they just took six episodes to actually kind of start hitting their stride and then getting into that that groove that Ryan was alluding to, perhaps. In my opinion, some of the very best songs came out of the very coming out of the Absolutely. first episodes of season three. At variety speak absolutely hysterical number so good in fact that they reprise it in season five with some slightly tweaked language and change some of the pop culture things that were relevant now at that point rather than in 1995 when they did it the very first time but also you get the president song all the words in the english language and those are just in the first eight episodes of season three they they came loaded for bear at least in terms of the musical standpoint. I'll give you that. Those songs are really good. All the words in the well, English language is fun. It's funny because the words in the English language really is just a rehash of, of the country song, really. I think it's the same tune. It's just he's yeah. putting mm -hmm. in the, the words. But to me, the funny thing about that segment is the commentary that Dot and Dick Butler... Absolutely. <laughs> and they cut to commercial and come back a couple times and, yeah. Yeah, and the fact that they actually have Dick Button, the figure skating commentator, voice Dick Button. And, of course, everyone listening right now is, who the heck is Dick Button? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can explain, Michael, for any younger viewers that might be listening. Well, Dick Button was a figure skater himself, and, of course, after he became a figure skater in the Olympics, he went and became a figure skater commentator and was quite well-known for his figure skating commentation. Commentation? Commentating. Commentary. <laughs> Comments, yeah. If he was the... If you're into the whole brevity thing. Yeah. Jeez. Brevity. Sorry, movie <laughs> reference. That's not allowed. I've gotten in trouble for that before. No, you can make movie references. We just can't have a whole conversation. You just won't let me. Okay. Correct. <laughs> 
the John Madden of figure skating announcers. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> that's more sports. Never said before. <laughs> oh, R.I.P. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because he just passed away. Like mm-hmm. three days ago, four days ago. Mm-hmm. Nick, yeah, do you I know, know who John Madden is? For John Madden. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? I, I don't want to piggyback off of that or Dick Button. <laughs> You can change the subject if you want. You're just staring at the screen blankly right now. <laughs> I'm just processing. <laughs> As we all are. <laughs> Did you know? I mean, I can, I would agree that losing Pinky in the brain, I do think, hurt Animaniacs as a whole. Like, little kid Nick watching these shows was more excited for Pinky in the brain when these were happening, coming out new. Like, those were funnier to me. And I don't. I would. I would say I enjoyed the Warners just as much as Pinky and the Brain. I don't. I don't know if I would have said they were my favorite. But once you did remove them, that was a noticeable difference. That being said, I love Slappy Squirrel. That's kind of my type of humor. And there's so well. much more. Yeah, <laughs> so, fill that gap. Yeah. I was happy I, to see a lot of Slappy Squirrel episodes in this in this watch because I was like, oh, again, having first watched them this run. I was surprised, and I was like, oh, I didn't realize how much more, based on what we got in the first chunk, that there was, and that she was almost essentially like the the B character to her as being the A characters, and I was yeah, for sure. pleasantly surprised. I'm not sure these are the my favorite Slappy Squirrel segments, but, I mean, there's some good ones. There's some good ones. I like, which one was it? It was, now I can't remember. Someone talk about Slappy more. <laughs> I have a note about how it must be season four, episode one or two. I have a note that says Slappy segment took a turn for the Bojack Horseman, and I'm not okay with it because yes. she like loses her memory and she's in a home. And oh yeah, that was uncomfortable. it was very dramatic. And then the cuckoo clock and the yeah. I think it's the opener to season four. Mm-hmm. One flew over the cuckoo clock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, a definite homage to cuckoo. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah, complete with scary medical personnel. I grew up watching, like many kids, watching those Looney Tunes cartoons in rerun after rerun after rerun, and always tried to figure out at the end because I'm weird like this. I would try and read the the Latin or the Roman numeral years that they were released, and try and figure out just how old they were. And then when I saw Slappy Swirl as kind of the future tense version of, you know, Bugs Bunny in his prime in the 1940s would be about this age and talking about what life was like back then and the various comedy shtick that they would use as an old retired actor. Even as a kid, for some reason, that resonated with me. It, It is the slapstick kind of kind of humor, but that that kind of old, but the fire is still burning type humor and characterization of her always always really made me laugh except when you know she loses her memory and is staring out a window sadly and it's very bleak i i mean yeah it was it was bleak it did hit i just i loved march brothers and three stooges growing up so as i was getting into this age i would look for all their other stuff and there's some pretty bleak interviews with like larry fine and even groucho towards the end oh yeah like th- this, this was i don't know who thought to make this cartoon for kids <laughs> the animaniacs <laughs> cult subtitle well, who thought to make this for kids it's a good question because i think back to the original point about whether or not these seasons are an improvement. I think these seasons are at least much more adult oriented, even than the first two seasons. There's a lot more esoteric concepts and there's also a lot more full on parodies that even at the age of 15, 16, 17 and up when I started watching these, I wouldn't necessarily have tracked back then. So, I mean, you have to have, you have to have had a pretty good birth of pop culture exposure to get all the jokes and I think even in these seasons which somehow aired in the kids block of WB there's even more elevated like and intelligent and clever and things that no kid less than 12 is going to get (laughs) so I think that's part of why maybe sorry go ahead Christian no I just I I I think that could be part of why I I feel like I actually kind of like three through five a little better just because like I I would not have guessed that 
having only seen seasons one and two, I would not have guessed that Animaniacs found a way to take more chances and like go harder and throw more shade and just get, you know, more cutting in their satire and more obscure in their references. Like I would not have thought that possible after seasons one and two, but they definitely, yeah, they go deeper. I think what it might've also been too, is they were willing to take more chances because they knew that their viewership had grown up a little bit. People who are sticking with the show could get a little bit more of those cutting remarks, those a little bit more of the satire, a little bit more of that esoteric humor. They were ready for it, and they were sticking through all the way, all the way to that point. So they they were willing to try and put themselves out there a little bit more because they knew that their audience was older and and able to digest it a little bit more. Presuming they followed it, that's my thing. <laughs> well, right, yeah, right, which three of us didn't, right, or couldn't. Within this block, they brought Kids WB brought one of the many shows that just aired the original shorts of Bugs and Daffy. So, like, the Bugs and Daffy show was part of this block. And it was mixed in with plenty of cartoons based on comic book characters, which most adults just think those are for kids, but, like, deal with heavier things like Batman and Superman. Watching them now, or the X-Men if we were back in the Fox era, not necessarily just for kids. Like, the people who write off cartoons as just for kids don't really realize what stories are being told and what kids can pick up on. And I think that they must have just taken it to the next level as they kept writing these stories or these shows. I liked how in the first, like the first chunk of this particular group of episodes, there was the please, please, please get a life found and where they actually <laughs> one of their own, their own internet trolls before internet trolls were even a thing. They, they have, barely a thing. Yeah, and they have like the nerdy types that are on the computer all day saying this was actually the 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 line is pay or play contract instead of the pay for play contract. It's a lot of people think to say it that that's that way, and of course there's also the part where there's it's uh, the captioning is wrong. Like they would just go on and on and on with this, and you know I thought that was that was hilarious, and of course there's these little jabs in certain episodes that like their competition on Disney. I think they made a reference to like the Tiger Prince. The Tiger Prince, which is a jab mm. at the Lion King. Oh, like, I thought it was a jab at Tiger King. <laughs> no. <laughs> we don't cover Tiger that King show reference. on this podcast because it's quote reality. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they all? <laughs> do a po- on a spoof in there too. group and a jab at some other Disney show that I can't remember. Yeah, but they go after these like honest. Them. Yeah, forget when the Disney Afternoon was done because it always everything I'm seeing is this was Kids WB was competing with Fox, and I know that Disney Afternoon started before both of the, these, but I just don't know when the Disney Afternoon ended. But Disney was on fancy cable, you see, whereas WB mm-hmm. would have been on either basic if you were lucky or light cable if you were That's right. less lucky. So Disney, I don't think, was as much competition for some households and certainly not yeah. when it comes to that after school time block. I think that was more of a 2000s thing when Disney yeah. became more widespread. Like I said, we didn't have cable, and I definitely watched the Disney Afternoon. At some point, it must have... I, I don't know. Like, I watched Gummy Bears and DuckTales. And That's because Duck- the Disney Afternoon was usually on Fox. And was in the uh, morning. And Fox created their own thing. Yes, and yeah. was in the morning. Like, DuckTales and Chippendales Rescue Rangers and all those shows, those were on in the morning on Fox. Mm. I remember that specifically because they came on as we were all getting ready for school. So... <laughs> Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was also on in the early mornings, too. I remember Wad stumbling upon that show as I was getting ready for school one day, and I was like, bright colors and dinosaurs. Ooh. <laughs> and eventually ninjas and dinosaurs. <laughs> I have no response. Thanks, the 90s. <laughs> I do. That's for a different podcast. <laughs> yeah, that is for a different podcast, which I'm not sure will work will cover but if you want to (laughs) and you want to moderate it tweet at us oh michael do you want to moderate a mighty morphin power rangers podcast i know somebody that would gladly do a mighty morphin power rangers i thought you were talking about dinosaurs i would be all over dinosaurs 
Oh, oh not no, the mama, the, not the there mama. are dinosaurs in Power Rangers. We're not talking about, yeah. not the mama. We're not talking about <laughs> no, the mama. No, I just, I, there, was a, there was a breakup in sound, so I thought Christian had said something about dinosaurs. But anyway, I do, I do know somebody Power that can really <laughs> moderate any more from Power Rangers episode. Yeah, so, I mean, it's available because I don't want to moderate it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, should we talk about the segment that was a parody of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Sure, go ahead. That was really funny. I <laughs> it was a bit of a jab at their competition because they were, you know, they made the whole, I love how they, they just was like, right, right. And that was their thing. And the, the, the weird animation with the, the Rita Repulsa cognitive was really funny and the way Tress McNeil the voice artist uh, was like really good impression of the Rita Repulsa character but also just like little details like her head was like a nest with birds <laughs> on it and you know the way that she was like I gotta I gotta get a monster to bring out to destroy the, the, the Warners and the way they adapted to like the platypus and the what were the three animals it was the platypus and the the power of the oh crap somebody re- remember what these what were they the platypus and the power of crap and <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> animaniacs good <laughs> thing. it was funny the good way night, they, everybody. The, 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 uh, <laughs> it was a really good satirical look at the popularity of mighty morphin power rangers and i laughed hysterically throughout that whole episode and the incessant electric guitar solos that was just shredding in the background just like in Power Rangers all the time, just that 90s power chord guitar. Totally. Very spot on parody. Oh right. yeah, they, they absolutely nailed it. And one of the things that I enjoyed very much about the last three seasons was the fact that their parodies, they almost always just hit home runs, starting with the Power Rangers one, which was clearly part of the biggest American pop culture phenomenon at the time, especially for kids. Mm-hmm. I was expecting a bit more commentary from the Warners, though, being like, maybe at the end, being a bit of a zinger of like, wait, why were we doing this again? And then there'd be like some sort of joke about that, because there was a lot of like, one thing I always loved is the self-referential humor of the Animaniacs. And it was nice to see that, especially, again, in the season three episode where it was just like, hey, we're going to do a cartoon just like we always do. And Dot's just like, eh. And they're like, wait, oh, what are you yeah. doing about? Why yeah. are you, what's, what, what's going on? She's like, yeah, I'm just not into it today. The Hercules one, like, right? Oh, you want to forget this cartoon? Yeah, sure, okay. Yeah, and they, they do they, that two or three times. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a lot more segues like that in this chunk. I was just thinking about the segment where they kind of go documentary style with it, and Dot is reciting the line incorrectly over and over oh, and her over name. and over yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the behind enjoyable. the scenes. Yes, the behind the scenes, behind the Animaniacs perspective. That's hilarious. I love it when they do stuff like that. Yeah, I love it when any cartoon kind of breaks that fourth wall and and treats it as though it's not necessarily a cartoon, but it's actors, and we're all just part of crafting this show, and. They, they make mistakes like actors do and they flub lines or they make a mistake or someone falls down the staircase in Family Guy, something like that that makes you go, oh, they're, they're treating it like it's a sitcom. I too oh, enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm just laughing because I'm reading my notes. <laughs> it's just funny lines. This not really helpful epi- for this, but, you know, I'll look back at this later and giggle. This is like the now. episode of Christian's Notes. Ha- that's one of the secret <laughs> hashtags. Hashtag Christian's Notes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like star date 29.95 plus tax <laughs> that was the star trek parody which was super was good and yeah i have a, like better better shatner than most is one of my notes i feel like somebody oh yeah and then like not slappy but Skip. somebody had like a bizarrely good bill clinton impersonation i'm brain dead i'm sorry oh, slappy's God. nephew help Skippy. thank you Skippy had a Has Bill like Clinton impression. One of the better Clinton impersonations I've ever heard. In what episode was that? Five. Dar Truck. Sorry, the the Shatner one. Yeah, that's. It's three, Maurice Lamarche seven. doing the Shatner. Maurice the Lamarche Captain does Corp. Shatner. I think I mentioned this the last time. 
I think I mentioned this the last time. I did go to C2E2 in the before times a couple of years ago, which is a big comic convention in the Chicago area, and all of the Animaniacs voice actors, well, the main ones anyway, were there. Rob Paulson, Jess Harnell, Tress McNeil, Maurice LaMarche, and then there were other people too. But they did this whole, like, they do this thing where they read a movie script and they switch back and forth between their most famous voices, and it wasn't just limited to the Animaniacs because... Many of these actors have been on The Simpsons, Futurama, a lot of the Matt Groening properties, and other stuff on Cartoon Network and that sort of thing. And so, I don't know, but Maurice LaMarche was instructed to do his Shatner a couple of times. <laughs> so that's what made me think of it. Yeah, the other one I had from that was to seek out new life and new satirizations, which is key, like, <laughs> prime Animaniacs. That's good stuff. It's good stuff. They did, they did make fun of uh, James Duhan's weight gain a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah, <laughs> sad face. Yeah, I don't think it's, it helped his heart different. troubles. <laughs> so, yeah. aw, rest in peace, Scotty. We love you. <laughs> all right. Do you have a favorite of any of these seasons, or do they all kind of run together? They definitely ran together for me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I agree with that. They, I mean, I think I had, I was more drawn to the third season just because that was more the when it switched over to the WB, they obviously ordered more episodes, so they probably had more money and more time to put them together rather than the other ones, because it was probably more just like, oh, well, we're doing well enough that we'll order like eight more, nine more episodes, and then they just insert them into the rotation of episodes that they were airing at the time. So you might see an occasional new episode one week and then start repeating what you've seen already. They may not have had a lot of time to put them together or whatever. And I just think by ordering that big chunk, a lot of good jokes, a lot of good puns, a lot of good parodies in there. The Sound of Music one, the Star Trek. I like the, my favorite one, I think, is the Warner segment where they do the gritty detective noir drama which was so, it was just a mile a minute classic pun jokes and just absolutely great. That one I was, would watch repeatedly. Was that the one where they do, it's like Maltese Falcon? It's yep. like some other MacGuffin thing that they're... Yep. Yep. I'm not going to lie, I don't remember the Beauty and the Beast parody with Taz as the Beast, which I feel like I always loved when both Tiny Toons and Animaniacs pulled in from those original Warner cartoon characters. I just don't remember that one at all. I was in season four. Yeah. Wait, let me consult my notes. notes. To the notes. Actually, my even just vaguely referencing the old timey Batman just now reminded me there was an Adam West. Yes. Camp yes. Out, which was I just made me so happy. Oh yeah, that was in the same episode as the Friends and right at the very end Seinfeld parody. Which was brilliant. That one had absolutely rolling. Having yeah. ended up watching a lot of Friends episodes, that that spoof had me just rolling in my apartment. That was very on point for the time for them to do that. <laughs> I did enjoy that parody as well as Friends is, if you didn't already know, one of my all-time favorite shows as well, so I just thought that was really funny. Kylie, I've got a question for you. Okay. As a, as a certain fan of a certain band, I was curious to know what you thought of the Hard Day's Night episode. I oh. loved it. <laughs> I forgot about, see, this is the thing. These ones went by so fast, but that was a good one. I did recognize it for what it was. I love the fact that they made Wacko play Ringo a la A Hard Day's Night. If you've ever seen the movie, he has this whole solo trek by himself. <laughs> and it was really fun that they kind of used that homage to the voice, which was already an homage to begin with. So... I loved it. But they also had, like the the songs too are very Beatles esque sounding songs, which I thought was yeah. a really good on the part of the musicians and songwriters that they managed to nail the feel of those famous Beatles songs. And I love the uh, you know it starts out in black and white and they enter a door. And it's like oh thank goodness we're out of there away from our fans. No, from that black and white segment <laughs> and and like the little montages of like you know the still images and how how those are so very similar to the Hard Day's Night movie. I mean, it was all very, again, another solid on-point parody of something that probably kids watching were like, what? 
which is exactly what I thought. There are actual notes that they pull from A Hard Day's Night. Like there's that whole interchange, if you've ever seen A Hard Day's Night, that John has in the stairwell with this woman who recognizes him without actually yeah. recognizing him. And they pulled that into the cartoon. And like, again, what 12-year-old child is going to know that? I might have known that because I loved the Beatles and was weird for that but everybody else in the world like the average 12 year old i don't think they would have got that joke and it was a sizable portion of the segment <laughs> so yeah that was hilarious that i love that it, both in a hard day's night and in the way they took from it <laughs> and the way she's like wait a minute and then she just screams and goes after him mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that's what you did in beatlemania <laughs> <laughs> Hell, Myra was one of the Mia fans in the episode, which is hilarious. Ah, there were a lot of Tiny Toons crossovers in this particular segment as well. Which so Tiny Toons was done by now, right? By these yeah. seasons, yeah. So I feel like they had a lot more latitude to just have some random guest appearances by the Tiny Toons. Here you go. <laughs> you need a job now. <laughs> right. A lot of those people were the same. Voice actors. Yeah. I, I know pa Rob Paulson in an interview said that he was working on Tiny Toons in a smaller role. And when he heard they were coming up with this, what ended up being Animaniacs, the show that was going to feature more music, he kind of got, he busted into whatever, whoever was planning it and was like, he basically said, you'd be an idiot not to include me because I can sing and I'm already work Like, you know what I can do. So I know that, yeah. Animaniacs kind of, replaced that tiny i don't even think they overlap they did I overlap a little bit too. i think they overlapped a little bit i don't think rob paulson was still doing much with it when they did but i don't i don't think they were consecutive and, and then it, it, tiny tunes wasn't on the list of kids wb stuff okay. so at this point for these seasons tiny tunes was definitely done fair enough so did anyone notice the movement and change to the joke credits no longer was it Catherine Page? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you? Would, I noticed like they would mention like, oh, this segment happened. And you're like, what segment was that? And then it was just, and it real, eventually I realized, it was like, oh, that's the joke credit. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was usually it was right after the episode number. There was a slide with the episode number and then a slide with the joke credit. That, And they got to be quite wordy by the end. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me like, nope, didn't see that, except Michael. Did you miss I, the joke credits? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you have a reason to rewatch it. <laughs> I just want to remind you, though, didn't, there was some reference to, like, a script supervisor was a character for a second on an episode, wasn't there? Was that the same one where she kept getting a line wrong? I was like, well, what's a script supervisor? Or, never mind. I don't have a note for it. I don't have, there's no notes for this specific thing, so I'm done. It's yeah. not the same as the joke, right? <laughs> so I don't know. What, you're well, what was the person's name? Because they they said a specific, an actual. Because I thought it was somebody that I whose name I had actually seen in credits. In the first, but two apparently it was. Yeah, in the first two seasons, the joke credit was always Catherine Page had a different title. It might have started off as script supervisor, but it did not stay there. Mm -hmm. But in these three seasons, there was an actual. There, it wasn't attached to a person. It was just a random. Sp flash of words in a joke format that was at the bottom of one of the credit slides. There was usually a slide okay. that had, this is the episode number, and then the next slide had at the bottom, here's your joke credit, insert joke. Yeah, I did pick up on those. I do remember watching those, and the weird thing is, is we got near the end in season five, they started getting a little salty towards the WB network. <laughs> Now that I will go back and find. <laughs> <laughs> because they definitely were getting shorter episode orders and they knew their time was running out and it started to go a little bit meta in those joke credits. <laughs> yeah. they, they started getting a little, little less innocent humor and a little bit more, not necessarily a shot across the bow. Resentment. <laughs> the pointed jokes bit. got pointier and pointier. Every time. More pointy than a pointed stick, for sure. I think for the, the very last one, which was episode number 99, mm -hmm. the joke credit was, if you're looking for episode 100, just wait and wait and wait <laughs> and wait. <laughs> 
<laughs> Highly recommend. Maybe YouTube did it. Go find these joke credits because they they are multi layered and multifaceted. It isn't just Catherine Page anymore. <laughs> nice. The Maniacs Wiki will tell you each and every one of them. I no. think if you click on the individual episode pages, the Animaniacs Wiki will tell you what the joke credit is. There's a wiki for everything. Next there hashtag. should be a Warner Wiki. Warner Wiki. Kind <laughs> of ruins the fun of looking for it, but... Well, I'm just trying to help out the people that didn't see the credits, Ryan. Yeah. It saves time. <laughs> For sure. It saves time, like the Hulu next episode automatic feature that is the reason I didn't see any of the credit stuff. There is that. You had to turn that off if you wanted to yeah, see the joke yeah, credits. I had to put forth effort. <laughs> That's totally fair. Yeah, so the secret's out. Okay. Did you notice all of the new rhymey things in the main theme song? I noted that I especially enjoyed Frasier Craney because that was very contemporary at the time. You know, when they're yeah. going, la, 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 totally insane insert joke line, and a maniacs. Okay, Frasier Craney was my, my favorite one because he was listening right at that moment. <laughs> My first two notes, actually, are no Bill Clinton sacks, question mark, question mark. His presidency and was over. And credits, huh? His presidency no, I, I, was done. <laughs> I, yeah, I eventually put it together. But then the second one was rhyming credits bit setting up episodes more. Because I know at least like with the, the flamey, the little flame little guy flame. With, yeah. who was in a bunch of the historical, that was a, a few times where like that rhyming section would reference something in that episode which I didn't remember possibly at all in seasons one and two. No, they no. didn't do that. The seasons one and two. Yeah. yeah. But no, they literally, when in the first episode where the flame comes back in the midnight ride of Paul Revere, he, they, the, that joke is here is the flamey or something to that effect. So I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the original, say the first season of however many episodes, they really repeated. Here's the show's namey an awful lot. Yeah. With some Dana, variation. That was that got repeated a lot. Mm -hmm. Default. Mm -hmm. But in this one, even though there were some recycling, if Pinky and the Brain was going to be in the episode, they would bring back Pinky and the Brainy. But most of it, there was a lot of newer creations for these three seasons for that line. I enjoy those. I like little, again, kind of like the Futurama subtitles. I like the when they do that to the main title because, you know, that means they did some effort. They had to go yeah. back and overdub some stuff. <laughs> so. One of them, I think, was actually in reference to like a movie that bombed at that time. But they don't mention the movie. They just, they're sitting in a movie theater. They're showing a screenshot, a parody screenshot of the movie. And I think it's like a Kevin Costner Western or something. Was uh, it Waterworld? Like, Waterworld was a massive bomb in the late yeah, 90s. Yeah, Waterworld because he's dressed in like, he's dressed in Western wear. So I don't know. I'm going to look it up because it was one of the season three episodes. He was also but, in The Postman, which wasn't a commercial success, but it wasn't the critical failure that Waterworld was because that was the big yeah. deal at the time. They spent all that money on Waterworld and it hardly made any of its money back. The Postman was not quite as expensive, but by then Kevin Costner had lost a lot of his mojo in terms of right. film draw. Star power, yeah. yeah. But I don't but remember I, that I episode. A lot of those were very pointed to certain things going on and that they were definitely more original and they didn't want to recycle anything, which I, I appreciate it too. I think that's really good. There was definitely a lot more late 90s satire stuff in these three seasons, which again raises the question how many kids in watching the kids WB would have glommed on to that satire at the time. Maybe right. Friends, because that was ubiquitous, but like some of the mm -hmm. other stuff was just, you know, Power Rangers, of course, but some of it was just not kid but it, stuff. I think it goes back to... It goes back to those Bugs and Daffy cartoons where you're just, as a kid, you think it's just absurd because it's surrounded by absurd things. But so much of the, the lo original Looney Tunes was commenting on the time. Like, literally, Bugs saying, what's up, Doc? He was quoting a movie. And 
adults went nuts the first time he mm-hmm. did that. Like, what was it? Our Cary Grant leaning on a tree eating carrots saying, what's up, Doc, in a movie. That's what Bugs Bunny was parodying. And because every single movie theater erupted in laughter when that happened, Bugs Bunny did that in every single cartoon. But, Is that like Philadelphia Story or something? I can't no. remember what movie it was, but it was literally he was eating, he was gnawing on carrots, his character. Yeah. I, so 100%, I 100% guarantee that it was not Philadelphia Story, because that's one of my favorite um, movies. It did happen one night. Clark Gable eats a carrot in It Happened One Night. And, does he um, say what's that, up, Doc? That, well, he doesn't say what's up, Doc, but the carrot eating is from Clark Gable in It Happened One Night. I own that movie, too. I don't know. Yeah, there's a part he, like, because, you know, it's the 1930s, and because they were traveling and didn't have a lot to eat, so he just randomly, like, got a carrot and started eating it, uncooked, and that was rare at the time. So, you know, it was a big thing. And, of course, It Happened One Night was one of the biggest movies in 1935, so... But a lot of that was on Claudette Colbert's leg. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just saying. I don't remember this carrot bit, but it's been a long time since I've watched the movie. Maybe that's my my watch tonight in in the middle of catching or reviewing season one of a certain Star Trek show that Nick's about to moderate. (laughs) (laughs) Clark Gable, It Happened One Night. Okay, so that's you're confirming that's the reference? Mm-hmm. Clark Gable's leaning on a fence, and it happened one night. He has a mouthful of... He, well, gives instructions with a mouthful of... Never mind. Whatever. That's what it's from. Congratulations, Michael. You get the cookies. Michael gets half... Or, or, sorry. Nick gets half a cookie for looking it up, but not really using English. <laughs> Clark Gable, that's what we got. <laughs> <laughs> he leans up against the fence eating carrots and gives instructions with his mouth full to Claudette Colbert's character. Yep, not named Doc. Sweet. <laughs> the, line of, the line I'm referring to in the song is Money Down the Drainy. Oh, and, yeah. Um, it, the joke credit is in reference to Waterworld. It's Why uh, Waterworld Bombed. No peppy songs with lots of lyrics. <laughs> I get points for that one because I identified the movie. <laughs> you get the other half of Nick's cookie. Woohoo! <laughs> I get the bigger half. Yeah. Because <laughs> math. Math. <laughs> Did you have a favorite pop culture homage? There were a lot more episodes in these three seasons that were themed around these homages. Like we've mentioned quite a few of them Cuckoo's Nest, Hard Day's Night, Power Rangers. Did you have a favorite? I am quite partial to the Hemingway one. My note is just, like, it's the best Hemingway depiction since Midnight in Paris. Oh, wow. Well, that's chronologically, but since I've, I've seen. And then there's, like, sorry, I thought Nick was raising his hand to say something. Uh, I was okay. going to just comment on the Hemingway one taught me in reverse. Like, I saw that cartoon before I knew who Hemingway was. Yeah. And then I learned about his, I remember learning about Hemingway and my brain clicking to this cartoon of how he uses shorter sentences like so what you're saying is animaniacs is in fact educational programming it really oh, yeah. was All oh, yeah. I would absolutely contend that like you're always like well into so you know in my case i didn't see three through five as a kid but from the stuff from one through two so i was probably still today it probably still happens where i'm just suddenly watching something and i'm like is that who they were referring to <laughs> 25 years ago? <laughs> like, now I know. So well, again, an educational in reverse, but it counts. If you memorize the president's song, you'd be able to learn the order of the presidents. I mean, so that's mentioned, one, quite a bit. Yeah, I mentioned in, in the previous podcast that the, the first thing I ever sang in a talent show was in fifth grade, I sang the president's song, utilizing all three voices because my voice was a little bit higher in fifth grade and could <laughs> hit dots notes. But yeah, I still to this day remember when I was watching and that episode came up, I just started mouthing along. And even now, I still probably had about 89 to 90 percent of that tune still up in my head, ready to go. I don't know it by that, heart, but it's one of my favorites. I just wrote down, and Jerry Ford fell down a lot. <laughs> I had to write that. I'm like, well, oh, yeah. Okay. He did. Chevy Chase launched his career impersonating that. (laughs) And Ford didn't like it. It made him sad. Oh, well. 
<laughs> Everyone's had better days, I guess. Any other favorite pop culture homages? As a big fan of Power Rangers growing up, that Power Rangers spoof was just one of my absolute favorites. It really, really was, just because how how accurately they nailed the satire on it. Right. That was me doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mealy, 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 mealy. <laughs> Yes. Did you? Oh, one of the, I don't know if this was a post credit thing or just the end of the episode, but I wrote it was about the they're doing the Waltons thing in the tower. So we're the shots just outside the tower, and they're all saying good night. Uh-huh. And then after a pause, of course, one of them does say good night, John Boy, and then he just screams, "Let me out of this!" <laughs> <laughs> Here again, how many kids at that age are going to know the Waltons yeah. in the nineties? <laughs> And beyond. That's hilarious. Season five, they do like the Scooby Doo. Is that the one where it's Scooby Doo and Fat Albert and. Yes. They attack. Yogi Bear. They attack Anna Barbera, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Yogi Bear. They make fun of how two dimensional it is and so. Yep. <laughs> Yogi Bear, Scooby Doo, and Fat Albert get it parodied. Which is crazy because Frank Welkers is the voice of Fred and he's ralph and the ceo like he's part of animaniacs but i guess family guy has been anytime they make fun of someone if they can like frank welker has done fred on family guy and so and megatron and they try to get those people because they know it's but i don't know it's just fun to have a cast member from the show you're parodying right there it also really legit i mean it legitimizes any animation But it legitimized Animaniacs as something that could be appreciated by so many people when the actual actors came on and did their own stuff. Like, we already mentioned the Adam West one, and granted, he was kind of looking for work at the time, but it was still really fun to hear Adam West in his role on that show. And I watched the original Batman. (laughs) I was going to say, oddly enough, that would have been one I would have gotten as a kid, Mm because that, for some reason, I, I watched... Some of the original. That was on in syndication in the 90s. Yeah, that was the 1966 Batman was replayed and replayed in syndication in the 90s. I specifically remember watching it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the series finale. Do you remember the 99th episode other than the on and on and on joke credit, which was basically kind of a big Broadway closing (laughs) number in devotion to everything that the Animaniacs was? What do you think of that series finale? One that they actually knew they were going out on. Yeah, I. it's a little heartbreaking to watch that episode because you get one original segment with the scoring session, which features all of the characters in some capacity, which is great, but they don't get really anything to do other than play off of a really pompous conductor. So... That's fine, I guess, but then they literally had an extended... It was pretty obvious they were trying to fill time because they did an extended an extended theme song where they just did an instrumental part in the theme song to fill time, and then literally the final segment, it's just three segments, the, a, the, the Good Feathers doing recycling a bit from an earlier episode then it's the scoring session and then it's the the animaniac suite which is just all instrumental and it's kind of just heartbreaking to watch because it's just like oh this is the last episode they knew it was the last episode but they didn't really do much right jokes well yeah going off what you just said about the 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 opening that extended opening they also went back in the vault and pulled out the original opening. They mentioned right. all the characters, including a number of them who hadn't been featured on the show in a very long time. They pulled out the Bill Clinton sax joke, and then they threw in their instrumental in the middle. So it was one of those tying it up in a, in a nice bow as opposed to what they had been running. So do you think it was heartbreaking like Michael thinks it was, or do you think it was better that they did this sort of musical bow tying? It was it was heartbreaking and nice that they were able to tie it up. Yeah, it wasn't just, it's over, it's done with. As I was watching season five, I actually found myself looking at the, the two-parter Hooray for North Hollywood. And when they finished that, I went, man, that felt like a de facto series ending right I there. remember that, thinking that too, yeah. And because after that, there was some stuff that I was watching going, boy, these almost look like retreads. 
in the last couple of episodes where some of the animation looked quite older. Some of the, the, the jokes didn't quite, weren't quite as sharp as before where I was, I started thinking, man, maybe these were some segments that had been abandoned in earlier seasons that they were just kind of going, well, we got two more episodes to put stuff in. What do we got on the cutting room floor? And it was Schnitzel and Floyd burning my notes. <laughs> the, the musical thing at the very tail end was a nice curtain call for everybody. It sounds like something people who really enjoyed what they were working on would do. And like it was more for them than the audience, maybe. I don't know how much it would hold up, especially if you think about how they ran these in no particular order and reruns and in mm, other... Right. Like this one, but it did have Michael McKean as the conductor, so that's fun. That's true, Michael McKean. I liked it. I mean, I don't know how many anime, or sorry, I don't know how how many animated vehicles get an actual series finale. And even though this show was ultimately rebooted, and that series finale is kind of a time capsule, a little bit moot. I thought it was interesting. Again, being that this was the first time that I went through these episodes that I can remember, I thought it was kind of novel, actually, that we were watching something like this, even if it wasn't exactly... I, I mean, it's heartbreaking in a sense that it was over. I guess I didn't know what else they could have done that wouldn't have been business as usual and still had that nice little grace note of this is in fact the end and we're not going to be traveling to some other kid's block as a result of this. And oh, by the way, a little F you to the WB in the credits. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which makes me think that something behind the scenes was not very appreciated by the writers or, or the animators or the voice cast. Something something in there, just it, it because of the, the sudden turn in those joke cards, towards the WB network. Warner I don't Brothers, think it was really agreed upon ending. Yeah, Warner Brothers has a long history, and we've discussed this in other panels, of kind of taking their properties and trying to choose the <laughs> proper word, messing with them to the point of squeezing the enjoyment out of them a little bit. And I would guess that what probably happened here is a couple of things. The research that I did make it, that I did before this particular episode made a pretty pointed note of saying that viewership dropped quite drastically when it moved to the WB because the original viewers, not all of them followed, not all of the markets had the show. And then they put it in the kids WB block, which was not in the same block as the Fox kids block, which was right after school, or maybe it was right after school, but in a different time. So people did not find these find these episodes until later the wb was also trying to launch this network in a way that marketed and branded its own content so they were yanking back a lot of their contracts there was a lot of shows that kind of made this jump another show we talk about on our podcast that's in the archives if you want to listen to it is sabrina the teenage witch which started off on abc but then the wb yanked it so that it could be on their network because it was a warner brothers produced property but then the whole tone of the show changed because not everybody followed it it would have been a pay cut it would have been a bunch of stuff so i think there was just a lot of production company miscalculation I don't think they realized exactly what they had and then you have Steven Spielberg's name on it so you got to negotiate with him I just think there was a lot of financial pieces number one and I think there was just a lot of miscalculation as far as who the show really appealed to in the end because even though I think preteens and teens of the 90s loved it and got it and watched it and followed it and now we're talking about it as adults I don't think there were enough of us to sustain that show at the time. You know, my parents didn't give a crap about it. They were just like, oh, here's that cartoon y'all watch, <laughs> you know? And my youngest siblings don't care. Like, they're the ones that are at least five years or seven years younger than me and my brother. They didn't watch this show. There was definitely, like, a time frame of people that, depending upon who you were, where you were, how you got the show to begin with, would have found the, these three seasons. And then the WB was too busy trying to turn over its content to figure out what would work to give it a really good chance. Other than Batman and Superman, which is their brand, but then that's a whole other co topic of conversation because they're not doing right even by Batman and Superman. 
But that's for a podcast we probably won't do because they're movies. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I have very strong feelings, but not as strong as my siblings. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so the <laughs> end. <laughs> The Animaniacs was created by Tom Ruger, as we mentioned, who also created the Tiny Toon Adventures, Road Rovers, Hysteria, Sushi Pack. He's generally affiliated with Disney Animation and Warner Brothers Animation. Did he further influence your love? Did I ask this question the last time? Did he influence your love of Animaniacs? Would you watch other animated vehicles he makes? If he makes any more. It's been a while. Um, Is Freak is another main one, I guess, after that? Freakazoid was not on the list for him specifically. He might have written on it. You did mention Hysteria, which is kind of I that is a forgotten show. Oh, oh and apparently Nick doesn't like it. He gave a thumbs down <laughs> that nobody saw. But well, you just narrated it. <laughs> I remembered Hysteria and I thought Hysteria was hilarious. It was hysterical. Oh, you didn't say, okay, there it is. <laughs> like you said hilarious, not hysterical. But then you it said hysterical. Did not and this might be, I might have been aging out of this. I'm not sure, but it was not, it didn't, I don't know. This speaks to who I was, I guess, because I was still loving the Sylvester and Tweety Mysteries. So, <laughs> which seemed like that was more for kids, even though it probably was just basically a murder she wrote. But Hysteria just, that's when I would twist, flip the channel. I just couldn't, it didn't hold me. I tried to be history, but fun. And I don't think it, I don't know. It seemed over the top. You you prefer wish, Wishbone? I didn't really watch Wishbone either. What? Even I've seen Wishbone. Come on. Well, I've seen it, but I wasn't like, oh, I gotta watch this dog reenact. Oh, I never. I, I was just being nineties nostalgic. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. <laughs> I've never seen Hysteria or or the other, nothing other than Tiny Toons. I've seen Tiny Toons. What was this guy's name? Tom Ruger. <laughs> He's written on a bunch. These are just the ones he created. He has his own blog where he has commented on his feelings about the reboot. And he has his own <laughs> blog about his other animation and the history of the Animaniacs. And so, I mean, he, he's still a figure right now. And I've read some of his stuff. And I think he's very talented. And I think his sensibility was what made Animaniacs what it was. And having watched Hysteria and Freakazoid, I can see his sensibility in his comic sensibility in those two shows. And that absurdity, the the irreverence, the but also wanting to have that element of especially in Hysteria, he wanted to actually have some factual basis for these characters. And he but also play with the history of it and being like here's the truth but also we're going to play with it and just take it to its logical absurdity <laughs> and hysteria was a lot was also a very musical show like animaniacs was which i appreciated it was also an ensemble comedy now i understand that the you probably some of the characters on that show might not have hit well with viewers because who remembers any of them i remember him just because i thought the show was hysterical and i can still remember the two theme songs they had so if tom ruger were to do something more if i saw his name attached to a new show i would be all over it okay so going back to something you said he has thoughts on the reboot meaning he's not involved in it he is not involved with it in fact he was pointedly not involved with it and he was not too happy the fact that they did not ask him to be involved with it. Yeah, I mean, like, they basically went ahead with it without him. I, I think they got his permission, but only because they had to. And he felt, he basically felt like he had no choice in giving permission, because it's like, well, they're going to do it anyway, so I guess I'll sign off on it and get paid, because they'll have to pay him something, because his name was attached to it. But basically, most of the, the reboot... I mean, like, he's not a writer on it, he's not a creator of it, he's not... If he has any kind of credit on it, it's only for, like, contractual reasons, so... That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be covering the reboot seasons in our next episode, the two that are out right now. I'm gonna read this blog. I think I need to. Yeah, it's, it's actually a really good blog, and he's very... He hasn't written on it a lot lately, unfortunately, because... I think he's just, you know, been involved with other things. But 
Yeah, his blog is... What is the name of it? I'm looking it up right now. It is... Where is it? <laughs> I'm trying to find it. Oh, wait. I think I found it. It's Cartoonatics on blogspot.com. Car- yeah. Cartoonatics? Yeah, cartoonatics.blogspot.com. Like his last post was February of 2021. Oh, so it's been a year. Yeah. 11 months. Oh, one of the Close wonderful enough. posts... Don't exaggerate, Kylie G. Gosh! One of the posts that he did is that he wrote a book called Will You Wear a Mask in reference to the pandemic, and he got Mark Hamill to read the book that he wrote and I think there's a video of it somewhere on YouTube. Yeah. Well, he, now I have to watch on, that. He worked on Batman, the animated series, which Mark Hamill was the Joker. So that I'm sure they're friends. There we are. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, he's still active. He's still doing stuff. And he's obviously got ideas. <laughs> and opinions. <laughs> I know. So would any of the rest of you, other than Nick's non-love for Hysteria, would you watch anything else he makes or has made? I used to watch Tiny Toons when I was a kid. Especially, they tended to air back-to-back for a while, especially on the Fox Kids block. Mm -hmm. So if I caught Tiny Toons, if I was back in time to to catch Tiny Toons, I'd usually watch them. And then I'd stick around and watch Animaniacs, because that was really what I was there for. So if he came out with more stuff, I'd probably give it a shot, for sure. I wasn't familiar with the other stuff that he's done outside of those two, but yeah, I'd I'd give it a shot. He clearly has a knack for creating very sharp-witted comedy. Would you follow, or have you followed, the voice actors? The big three? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I know, right. The big three here are Rob Paulson, Jess Harnell, and Tress McNeil. Maurice LaMarche is like practically one of the three, but the fourth one, <laughs> because he is the brain. But of course, there are other pretty heavy hitters in the cast. Not not all of them have long animation voice acting resumes. Some of them do. Sherry Stoner, I believe, is the voice of Slappy Squirrel, and she was a production person on the Animaniacs. I don't know that she's really gone on and done a lot of voice acting, for example, and a couple of the other actors, voice actors, are people that do voice acting but are not necessarily as recognizable as these big four, but would you follow any of these four? I will say that I have because Trent McNeil is like one of the major players on The Simpsons and also Futurama. They, they all, all of them have been on Futurama. Whether you you're following Tressa McNeil, either intentionally or not. She is in any, everything. Mm-hmm. She's she's probably the most like a Mel Blank where you can't get... It used to be Billy West, but I feel like he isn't doing as much. And Tress McNeil's... She works for all the big co- companies, and she is... If there's something Disney and a female is talking, Tress McNeil is probably doing it. And she's the Daisy Duck and has been for any time Daisy Duck talks, it's Tress McNeil. And Maurice LaMarche is everywhere as well. Once you break into Disney, they will pay you to do stuff (laughs) and bring you back. Yeah, it's kind of like the DC versus Marvel situation because Marvel's owned by Disney and DC's owned by Warner Brothers. I think it kind of works with the animated people. There's more crossover. People will work for both. It's not just two. I mean, Fox and it's... Yeah, they're they're all over the place. Well, now that Disney owns everything anyway. Yeah. Because technically The Simpsons is Disney now. That's true. That is Does that true. make Lisa a Disney princess? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the rules. There are strict rules. Not all Disney princesses are even Disney princesses. Okay. Jeez. That's for a different podcast, which I don't think we're going to do. <laughs> the Disney princess podcast? Somebody's <laughs> got to have one. Podcast. <laughs> well, here is the magical... Because <laughs> I don't know how to segue off that one. Here is the... Speaking ma- of segues. What? <laughs> Speaking of segues, oh. my favorite segue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hashtag Christian's Notes. Would you recommend the Animaniacs to others? Why or why not? The OG. The OG. Yeah, I would because it's real funny. <laughs> I don't want to derail you, especially because I don't have much to say, but we did billboard that we talk about Wacko's Wish. We did. I didn't watch it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you want to talk about this, Wacko's I... Wish? You, we, we can. Is it on? We don't want to talk about it. Is Wacko's Wish on one of the places, like Hulu? It is. It's on Hulu. I admit I haven't watched it yet either. It's been so long. 
You should cut it out of the opening. I feel like you mentioned it there that we would talk about it. <laughs> no, I didn't. So much mention editing it. on this one. I don't. If well, if I did, I I can cut it out. But yeah, yeah. No, I forgot to watch it, so <laughs> we're not watching. The one time I'm prepared. I'm sorry. Well, did you want to talk about it, Christian? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have notes. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Record a commentary and send it to Kylie. We could do a whole bonus track of Christian's <laughs> notes on Wacko's Wish. <laughs> I'll just send them to you. Right. Just copy and paste this shit. It's fine. <laughs> Write a blog post. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. We do have guest guest contributors. Can I just copy and paste them? <laughs> I don't know. Again, Depends this is what I'm saying. So I went to the notes. effort of this. I'm not going to go to more effort. <laughs> I'm just saying I did the appropriate amount of effort when it's actually not going to be it's fine. So let me re-ask the question. <laughs> Would you recommend the original Animaniacs? Why or why not? Yeah, it's funny and it holds up. Watch it. If you are a fan of animation, if you are a fan of reference humor, if you are a fan of of pop culture parody if you are a fan of zaniness and to the max silly and absurdity and the irreverency of of just being a cartoon character this show is for you and i'm pretty sure i have just mentioned maybe everybody who has a sense of humor because if you don't aren't any of if you don't like any of those things you don't have a sense of humor so says michael <laughs> bada bing bada boom <laughs> Are you i saying? don't think you could really say it any better than michael just did i absolutely i recommend this show for all of the reasons that that everybody has mentioned this show is a classic it holds up and it's still funny 20 plus years, almost 30 years now in the future. The only reason I can't imagine recommending somebody is just because I feel like we've all seen it. You know, it's <laughs> such a it's such a fixture. It's such a pillar of our generation and it does keep holding up. So into the streaming era, as long as people are finding the show, it's going to be a hit. And so it's like, like I said, the only reason I wouldn't recommend it is just because it's, it's goes, you don't need to because people, everybody's already seeing it. I hope that's true. I don't know if that's true, though. I hope that's Yeah, no, true. I hope so. I mean, it's idealism, but... Yeah. Well, let's just say if you haven't seen it, if you've somehow missed the boat, I 100% recommend it, too. I've already mentioned it's my favorite cartoon of all time. That remains true. And that's because it's funny, it holds up, and it has all the things that Michael listed that I can't possibly re-duplicate. <laughs> Any cartoon of all time. It is my favorite cartoon of all time. And there are quite a few that I enjoy and, and rewatch, but Animaniacs has so much variety to it, has the music, has the Easter eggs, the visual Easter eggs, the credits, the music, the parodies, the references. Like, it's got everything. And other animated vehicles have those things. But in many ways, Animaniacs kind of did a lot of that first or was one of the earlier, better versions of doing it. And so I like to give credit to the Pioneer. And you already said it holds up. And Ryan said it holds up. We're out however many years, a quarter of a century forward or more. <laughs> And it still holds up. It's still funny. And even if you don't remember the stuff they were satirizing because you say maybe weren't alive back, you know, back when they were doing it, a lot of that stuff is still circulating because Gen X and, and millennial people that would have watched this as a kid are now parents showing it to their kids. And so I think it has that kind of longevity and will keep having that longevity because it will never really go out of style. And I'm very curious to see, because I've heard highly, this is a foreshadowing, but I've heard highly mixed reviews on the reboot seasons. And now I'm hearing Michael's bit about Tom's blog and his non-involvement in the show. And so that makes me wonder just how how the new versions are going to work, which will make for interesting topic of conversation next time. But as far as the original five seasons wholeheartedly a plus 100 percent recommend this it's it works even just not as a cartoon but as a show and you don't have to pay a ton of attention to it you can still laugh at it but you're gonna miss a whole bunch if you don't 
too, which is, so it's got layers and levels for everybody. If I had a, the the 1990s were so full of fantastic animation, a lot of groundbreaking animation, and a lot of stuff that if I had a kid that I wanted to plunk down in front of the TV and introduce them to animation, there's a lot of good shows to choose from, and, and Animaniacs would be top five, if not top three, to show them. Because they, it, it still resonates. Even with the, the 90s pop culture references, there's still... How many parents still show their kids The Lion King? They'll, it means they, they'll get the parody if they watch that far into the show. So it, it is one of those top three 1990 shows that I would still show my kids today and ha- have them probably appreciate it just as much. And I think it's rare that an animated show that is designed for all ages to watch doesn't pander, which this one doesn't. I think there are some, even now, you know, there's a couple like Bluey comes to mind that I think has the same sort of resonance where it crosses all sorts of age groups and is going to resonate. But Animaniacs is also one of those and has been doing it now for such a long time. So, yeah. I, I just think really? it's excellence in television, period, but also excellence in animation and just generally good good fun. You are the second person this week to have mentioned Bluey. Now I have to watch this show. You do, it's, Bluey. It's, it's all over. Everyone loves it. It's Nobody really can good. dislike Bluey. It's not the same show. <laughs> <laughs> but it has it doesn't it doesn't pander. It's another one that does not pander. It's it stays direct and it stays it's it's emotionally true, if that makes sense. It brings joy to those who watch. <laughs> that too. Yay. But this is not about that show. We might do that show one day. Maybe Nick will moderate it. <laughs> is there I'll let Eli moderate. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> he needs to have to have to he has to make full sentences though. <laughs> He's getting there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I could read, and he could probably write it all out. All right, type up the points. Well, this kid's crazy. Get him started. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> For right now, other than what we've already discussed, is there anything else you want to say about the original five seasons of the Animaniacs? And I say five because you know, obviously, I can't we think of it. it. We covered it. All right, I'm very proud of us. Well, since we've covered it and we did such a great job, what I'd like to do is thank Michael and Nick and Christian and Ryan for joining me to talk about the original seasons of the Animaniacs. But never you fear, because we have more looking forward to do. Our next episode will be about the rebooted seasons, which we all have yet to watch, so it should be very interesting. (laughs) But for right now, we're just going to roll the credits. Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation Point! was produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, which is really another way of saying executively produced by me, Kylie Piet. My associate producers are Krista Pennington and Celine Resmer. I edit this podcast and our logo is by Rebecca Wallace. Our marketing graphic artist is Krista. Our theme song was written by Sarah Milbratz and sung by Sarah, Amy McDaniel, and Kels Resmer. Kels played the keyboard, Ian McDonough played the bass, Christian Somerville played the guitar, and the whole shebang was engineered by Kyle Aspinall and Christian. We hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us, give us stars, provide comments, or review us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, and Amazon are just a few of the places you can find us, but we're also on YouTube. We have our website. Otherwise, feel free to tell us how we're doing, what we should add, subtract, keep, or toss. You know how it goes. And if you have suggestions for shows we might consider, contact us at our website where we have a guest book. By email at Couch Potatoes Unite Podcast at gmail.com, our Facebook, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or wherever you get your podcasts. Though, of course, we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time, and always have new episodes coming down the pipe. Just listen to our intros. If you miss old episodes or want to know in general what shows we cover, just search for us. Find us wherever you do searchable things on the internet. Don't forget that exclamation point or contact us via our website, our email, our social media accounts, and stay up on all the new events and episodes by our humble little podcast, Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point! Until the next time, Animaniacs, both the original series and the reboot 
are available to stream in their entirety on Hulu currently. In the meantime, our Animaniacs panel will next reconvene to discuss the two available seasons of the reboot and part three of this Looking Back to Look Forward series very shortly. So until next time, until next episode, new episodes are published every Wednesday. Keep listening. Keep watching. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. See you. Good night, everybody.